Thank you so much for your very generous introduction and remarks, which I don't deserve it. Can you see me? <laughs> this, this podium is tall, and probably some of you can see my mustache and eyeglasses. <laughs> that is all right, really. I was thinking of walking with a mobile microphone, but apparently I have to be stuck here <laughs> and give my lecture. So ironing my trousers has been <laughs> useless <laughs> because you cannot see it. Friends, it is my pleasure and privilege to come to this marvelous gathering and address the issue of the evolution of the Baha'i scholarship. I'm thankful to the organizers of the Association for Baha'i Studies and wholeheartedly, really, I do hope that this presentation will be a humble contribution to the study of the background phases of progress and the future of the Baha'i scholars. I do hope that in the course of my presentation, my comments will shed sufficient light on the required endeavors of the younger generation of the Baha'i scholars and the role that they will have to play in its development. Baha'i scholarship like the Baha'i teachings, Baha'i writings, Baha'i history, has a very strong root and mighty connection with Islamic scholarship and the role that the ulama, Muslim clergy, Muslim doctors, theologians, jurists, ulama can be translated in many ways. I prefer the ulama rather than the English translation of it, and ulama is now, I think, is Anglicized anyhow. And the role that ulama played in Islamic civilization. In the Quran, the seeds of Islamic philosophy, theology, mysticism, jurisprudence were cultivated. It was upon the scholarly efforts of generations after generations of Muslim scholars that those seeds were developed, nourished, and matured. At the same time, it is a simple fact that the Muslim scholars were and still are primarily responsible for the misinterpretation of the Quran, the Hadith, oral sayings of the Prophet and the Imams, which have been conducive to Islamic sectarianism, disunity, and even enmity among the Muslims themselves and in their approach towards other religions. In a letter written on behalf of the beloved guardian on the 14th of March, 1927, to the Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Istanbul, it is pointed out how in the past it was certain individuals who accounted themselves as superior in knowledge and elevated in position who caused division and that it was those who pretended to be the most distinguished of all who always proved themselves to be the source of contention. When the Bob advanced his claim, he was accepted and admired by a group of ulama and received the greatest enmity from the ulama also. And we know, we don't forget that those ulama in Tabriz 
who sentenced him to death were among the highest level of ulama of that time. During the time of Baha'u'llah, we see the continuation of the same trend. He was accepted, supported, and admired by some distinguished ulama, such as Mirza Abul Fazgul Paigani, Fazil Qa'ini, and many others, who also, while also being severely attacked and opposed by the other scholars, such as Muhammad Baghir Najafi, known as Wolf in the Baha'i writings. His son, Muhammad Taghi Najafi, the son of the wolf in Isfahan. Haj Karim Khan Kermani, the head of the Sheikhi community, whose behavior is even reflected in the most holy book of Baha'u'llah, the Kitab Aqdas. And of course, Sheikh Muhammad Hassan and others. But the Kitab Aqdas refers to Haj Muhammad Karim Khan and Sheikh Muhammad Hassan, two distinguished ulama of the time of Baha'u'llah. In fact, one of the greatest challenges of Baha'u'llah was, on the one hand, to attract the ulama, and on the other hand, to show forth the shortcomings, prejudice, and the lack of credibility. In addition to dealing with the ulama and Islamic scholarship in his major books, such as the Kitab Aqdas, and the Kitab Iran, some of the leading tablets of Baha'u'llah are specifically revealed to the most influential clerics of his time, such as the tablet of Burhan, the tablet of proof, and the tablet of Qina, the tablet of the veil, and many, many, many other tablets that I don't want to give the, all the list here to Sadiq Sangelaji, to Mullah Ali Kani, to Haj Mullah Adi Sabzawari, and many other distinguished ulama of his time. In fact, a very important portion of the writings of Baha'u'llah has to do with the ulama of his time. And some of them have been the recipient of a specific tablet. In fact, one of the most extensive tablets of Baha'u'llah and most recent tablet of Baha'u'llah is revealed a year before his passing is the epistle to the son of the wolf. It is not an exaggeration to suggest that Baha'u'llah, in his 40 years of messengership, had nothing more substantive than challenging, abrogating, and changing the status, the role, and the authority of the ulama in the face of his efforts towards the liberation and democratization of the institution of the human being on this planet Earth. It's obvious that in Islam, particularly among the Shi'is, and my talk, I'm tonight more or less focusing on the Shi sect of Islam, and I don't deal that much with the Sunnis. It is obvious that in Islam, particularly among the Shi'is, the ulama have assigned themselves to be the, in charge of the private, social, political, and religious lives of the Muslim communities. And conveniently, the role of ulama among the Shi'is became distinguished around 2060 AH 872, when according to their belief, the son of the 11th Imam went into occultation. The period of this occultation, which is called the minor occultation, Ghaybat Zohra, for the sake of the Persian friends here, lasted for 70 years when the religious leaders of the time proclaimed that the hidden Imam had gone from the minor occultation to major occultation, Ghaybat Kobra, in 329 AH 
939, which has lasted for centuries and still continues to the present moment. After the occultation of the hidden imam, the leadership in charge of the affairs of the community became a very crucial issue about who is going to be the interpreter of the Quran. Who is going to protect the community? Who is going to issue the fatwa, religious order, religious sentences? religious opinion, religious order, and who is going to issue fatwa for jihad or the holy war against the infidels? Who will be in charge of the social, political, and educational affairs of the community, and who will deal with the daily running of the holy shrines, mosques, and other religious endowments? In brief, who is going to carry on the responsibilities and the duties of the imam who is now hidden? From this point onward, ulama came to play an active role in the individual social political issues of the community and gradually they developed tens of positions among the Shi'is and also the same institutions, the same positions are in, among the Sunnis and Sunni communities, such as Imams, Grand Imams, Muftis, Hujjatul Islam, Mujtahid, Ayatollah, Grand Ayatollah, Sagatul Islam, and these are the titles of different ulama according to their rank and knowledge and experience among the Sunnis and the Shi'is. And they are generally called, particularly among the Shi'is, as Rouhaniyun, the spiritual leaders of the community. They also claim to be the supporters of the Sharia and spiritual leaders of the community, and even to be in a position to legitimize the government and the political establishment. Velayat Fari, mandate of the jurist or the guardianship of the learned, which has been a controversial institution, particularly in the past 30 years in Iran, is the embodiment of the role of ulama in the community. Regardless of the rank, position, religious, and social status, the hierarchy of the Rouhaniyun, these spiritual leaders, ulama, is responsible for protection, propagation, education, guidance, economic, social, political affairs of the community. Baha'u'llah, from the early days of his mission, tried to challenge and abrogate the ulama's role and authority. For example, in his tablet of Besharat, Glad Tidings, he says, the first Glad Tidings is that the law of holy war, which was under the control of ulama, has been blotted out from the book. This is in the tablets of Baha'u'llah revealed after the Kitab Ardas. The principle of jihad, holy war, for centuries has been the most important religious institutions under the authority of the ulama. To cite a few more examples related to the role and the status of the ulama, and confi I, I con confine myself to several teachings of Baha'u'llah, particularly in the Kitab Aghdas. In the Kitab Aghdas, he prohibited his followers to ascend to the member pulpit. This is one of the rules of the Kitab Aghdas. He prohibited in the Kitab Aghdas his followers to ascend to the manbar or pulpit while lecturing people or reciting the writings. In this book, he says, ye have been prohibited 
from making use of pulpit. We know that Manbar pulpit has been a public scene for the ulama for centuries to advise, to educate, to agitate, to lead, and to mislead the public in the mosques. In the Kitab Aghdas, number two, in the Kitab Aghdas, are you getting tired? <laughs> if you are, please have a short nap. Is all right with me? <laughs> because I cannot see you from here. <laughs> and if you are having a nap, I will continue speaking. And if I come to a very important point, I will raise my voice to wake you up. <laughs> so. <clears throat> in the Kitab Aghdas, number two, in the Kitab Aghdas, he prohibited the congregational prayer, saying it had been ordained that obligatory prayer is to be performed by each of you individually, save in the prayer for the dead. The practice of congregational prayer has been annulled. And this is the exact verse of the Kitab Aghdas. And even if the prayer for the dead is a congregational prayer for the Baha'is, but is not performed by an imam, a member of the family of deceased, a member of the local spiritual assembly, a friend, somebody can say it even in that prayer Turning the attention towards Qibla is not necessary. We know that Salat or Namaz and Namaz Jum'ah, particularly Friday prayer or the prayer of, of the assembly, altogether congregational prayer, has been one of the most important institutions in Islamic civilization. And it is performed by the Imam or the leader of prayer, usually in the masjids, mosques, and a sermon is given, which is delivered at the particularly meridian prayer. The sermon has the role of advising, encouraging, and at the same time agitating the crowd to revolt and to rise against social and political authorities and institutions. Number three in the Kitab Aghdas regarding the Ulama has to do with this fact that Baha'u'llah prohibited the question of ta'avil. Ta'avil means interpretation, means personal understanding of the sacred text. Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Aghdas says that ta'avil or interpretation of the sacred writings about the ta'avil, he says, whoso interpreted that which has been sent down from the heaven of revelation and alter it, its evident meaning, he verily is of them that have perverted the sublime word of God and is of the lost, lost ones in the lucid book. This is the exact verse of the Kitab Aghdas prohibiting the question of Ta'avil. And Ta'avil is one of the major role of the ulama. The Ta'wil, interpretation of the Quran and Hadith, has been throughout centuries the main cause of sectarianism, has been the main cause for enmity, has been the main cause and a tool and a powerful tool by which the individual understanding of the ulama has been dictated to the public. Number four. Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Aghdas prescribes that all people deal not faithlessly with the right of God, who Allah, nor without his leave, capital H, his leave, make free with its disposal. In Islam, 
the individual ulama were in a position to receive and administer the financial contributions of the community. And in a very clear verse of the Kitab Aqdas, Hukukullah is not referred to individual Baha'is anymore. Number five, in Islam, the system of Awqaf, Awqaf means endowments, contribution for good things. In Islam, the system of Awqaf, religious donations or contributions, constitute the common source of income for the ulama. Whereas in the Kitab Aqdas, Baha'u'llah says, endowments dedicated to charity revert to God, the revealer, in, the revealer of signs. None had the right to dispose of them without leave from him who is the downing place of revelation. Then we come to number six. It is well established in the history of Shi's in particular, that after the major occultation in 941 that I referred to before, the Shiites were obliged to observe the taglid. Taglid means imitation, means to follow someone on religious matters, the question of taglid, imitation. In Islamic legal context, this taglid is very, very important means to follow the decision of a religious expert, mujtahid, or jurist, without necessarily examining the scriptural basis or reasoning of the decision. Blind imitation. Although the practice of Imitation has been enforced throughout the Shi'i history, particularly since the Safavid dynasty in the 16th, 17th centuries, ulama required the believers to turn to the source of taglid or to imitate or to follow the religious reference. And religious reference is marja'i taglid. Every believer is supposed to have a marja'i taglid and follow the decision on religious affairs, the decisions of that source, of that authority. They are supposed to do that for the religious practices, for guidance, as a model to be imitated. The institution of taglid and the marja'i taglid has been altogether abrogated by Allah in so many of his writings putting an end to the religious authority of the ulama to advise and to be followed in religious laws. For example, Baha'u'llah in the, kitab, in the tablet of Asli Kullul Qair, he says, the essence of all that we have revealed for thee is justice. Is for man to free himself from the idle fancy and imitation. discern with the eye of oneness his glorious handiwork and look into all things with a searching eye. Thus have we instructed thee, manifested unto thee words of wisdom that you mayest be thankful unto the Lord by God and glory therein admits all peoples. This is Tablets of Baha'u'llah revealed after the Kitab Aqdas. And this is one of the profoundest sections of Asli Kullul Khair as leaving out the question of imitation. Number seven, in many Islamic communities around the world, Muslim clergy act as judges and they are in charge of enforcing religious laws and conducting religious Ceremonies such as performing marriage ceremonies, divorce procedures, inheritance, funeral. And in fact, the jobs of the ulama is the 
interpretation and maintenance of Sharia law in those communities. In the Baha'i faith, religious laws are applied by the Baha'i institution at the local and national assemblies. In this regard, the Kitab Aqdas says, the Lord had ordained that in every city, a house of justice be established wherein shall gather counselors to the number of Baha nine, and should it exceed this number, it will not matter. It behooved them, the members of the assembly, to be trusted ones of the merciful among men and to regard themselves as the guardian. And the guardianship among the Shis is the role of one, of one, one, one of the ulama. The guardian appointed of God for all that dwell on earth. The underlying factors in this regard is the divine laws are God given, but its interpretation, implementation, expansion, and application are the human's job. Not individually, but collectively on the basis of consultation of the selected institutions that pronounce the results of the legislative decision authoritatively and that is binding by the individuals and communities. In this regard, the output of the learned, the religious experts and the scholars are essential, but new authoritative pronouncements on the religious needs come from the elected body, i.e. the Universal House of Justice, which is the embodiment of people's will. The guardian in the letter that has been written on his behalf on the 14th of March 1927 states that praise be to God, that pen of glory has done away with the unyielding and dictatorial views of the learned and the wise dismiss the assertions of individuals as an authoritative criterion, even though they were recognized the most accomplished and learned among men and ordained that all matters be referred to the authorized centers and specified assemblies. Even so, no assembly has been invested with the absolute authority to deal with such general matters as affect the interest of nations. Nay, rather, he has brought all the assemblies together under the shadow of the universal house of justice. One divine appointed center so that there, won't, there would be only one center and all the rest integrated into a single body, revolving around one expressly designated pivot, thus making them all proof against schism and divisions. The end of the quotation from the Guardian. By considering these rules of the Kitab Aghdas, one can see that Baha'u'llah, in fact, either eliminated the legal and social status of ulama or gave the role of ulama to the Baha'i administration as individual authority was absolutely abundant. Unlike many religions of the past, the elected institution of the Baha'i faith are divinely confirmed to direct the affairs of the faith on local, national, and finally, international levels. The power to act, however, resides at the level of individual initiative and collective volition. In other words, the individual believers is tasked with converting into action the decisions that are made by the consultative bodies. 
despite the fact that individual Baha'is have no role to play, like the ulama among the Shi'is, the Baha'is are, however, encouraged to study the writings. Baha'u'llah in the Kitab Aqdas says, recite ye the verses of God every morn and eventide. Whoso failed to recite them had not been faithful to the covenant of God and his testament. And whoso turned away from the holy verses in this day is of those who throughout eternity have turned away from God. Exact verse of the Kitab Aqdas. In this regard, the individual believer draws upon his love for Baha'u'llah, the power of the covenant, and the dynamics of the prayers, the inspiration and education derived from the regular study of the holy texts and the transformative forces that operate upon his soul as he strives to behave in accordance with the divine laws and principles. As such, to effectively translate the writings into action, no individual believer can afford ignorance. The responsibility to study the writings, the responsibility to be inspired by them, the responsibility to translate them into action, these responsibilities fall on the shoulders of every individual Baha'i. In the Baha'i writings, it's abundantly clear that the human intellect acquiring knowledge, scientific research, and academic study of the faith are highly admired and encouraged as one of the vital sources for the ever advancement of human civilization. It's also clear that in the Baha'i faith, the ulama have a very important role to play in the education and consolidation of the community, enrichment of the intellectual life of the community, and protection of the community against intellectual and religious attacks of others, provided that they have no right to govern the individuals, to impose their understanding upon the community, and to struggle among themselves for power and leadership. According to the Baha'i writings, and the messages of the Universal House of Justice, there exists no conflict between true science and religion, and human understanding of scientific and religious phenomena is limited. The Baha'is are not supposed to blindly accept the materialistic theories of the modern thinking as the harmony and the unity of the Baha'i community upholds the most important goal of the Baha'i faith. We read in the writings of the faith very often that the scholars have the responsibility to act tactfully by fully utilizing their wisdom, moderation, and humility. The scholars in the Baha'i faith like any individual and groups are supposed to be followers or the adherent to the basic principle of Baha'i ethics. That means that the Baha'i scholars are asked to be humble, steadfast in the covenant, fighters against their egos, just, and generators of knowledge in the community. They are to be the embodiment of the Baha'i virtues. In this regard, we call into mind the greatest illness of the ulama of the past dispensations, i.e. egoism, which poisoned and spiritually killed the learned. This illness represents itself to the Baha'i scholars as their most important enemies. The Baha'i scholars are advised to write apologetic works describing the truths of the Baha'i faith 
and convincingly defend its principle. Regarding this issue, Baha'u'llah, in his tablet to Haj Karim Khan Kermani, the tablet of Qena, the tablet of the Veil, Baha'u'llah states the following. Erlong certain learned souls will appear who will arise to render assistance unto God, who will answer every objection with conclusive and convincing proofs for their hearts will be inspired by the divine breath of the Spirit. He also, in the tablet of Salman, says it is absolutely incumbent on all persons to write whatever they can in rebuttal of those who have sought to refute God. Shall anyone pen a single word in rebuttal of a polemic against God, a station would be bestowed upon him such as would be the envy of the concourse on high. This is a provisional translation of the Tablet of Salmon. Writings, I cannot read my writings. I'm sorry, sometimes I get emotional. I was not supposed to get emotional at this point. <laughs> writings of the central figures of the Baha'i faith and the beloved guardian leaves no doubt that the Baha'i scholars are responsible to protect and propagate the faith. They are to be the, in the front rows of spreading and fostering the Baha'i education, collaborating with other learned of the world for the betterment of the human condition, to work with each other within the Baha'i community to increase the prestige of the faith and to qualitatively enrich the social fabric of the Baha'i communities. Regarding God's purpose for the human race, the House of Justice in the Rezvan message of 1967 said, this is the theme we must pursue in our efforts to deepen in the cause. What is Baha'u'llah's purpose for the human race? For what ends did he submit to the appalling cruelties and indignities heaped upon him? What does he mean by a new race of man? What are the profound changes which he will bring about? The answers are to be found in the sacred writings of our faith and in the interpretation by Abdul Baha and our beloved guardian. Let the friends immerse themselves in the ocean. Let them organize regular study classes for its constant consideration and as reinforcement to their effort, let them remember conscientiously the requirements of daily prayers and reading of the word of God enjoyed upon all the Baha'is by Baha'u'llah. The end of the quote from the message of 1967. It has been also leveled upon the scholars of the Baha'i uh, Baha faith to identify the good and the evil and to show forth the ways that evil can be defeated. It is upon the Baha'i scholarship to do research on the substantial needs of the world, define the deficiencies in such areas as illiteracy, poverty, 
disarmament, inequality between men and women, social injustice, and share its expertise to eliminate them. In another word, analytical approach towards current issues of social, political, and particularly educational concern from the Baha'i perspective is one of the most urgent contributions that the Baha'i scholarship can make in our time. In the message of the Universal House of Justice to the world religious leaders in April 2002, it was brought to the attention of the, it was brought to the attention the urgent need of the religious leadership to address the problem of religious prejudice. A problem that is becoming steadily a more serious danger to human well-being. Other responsibilities of the Baha'i scholarship could be in building and expanding the human capacity, bringing about awareness of the necessity of moderation and justice to the communities of human race, working on social development in local, regional, international levels, appraising the level of general knowledge of humanity regarding the purpose and the goal of life of the human being and to do research on different aspects of change in the value system of individuals and communal levels. The ethical question of human transformation, transformation to be naturally a fighter of evil and to be builder of good comes to mind as another responsibility of the Baha'i scholarship when its role or roles are concerned. In this gathering, now here is the point that I'm getting emotional. In this gathering, which is devoted to Baha'i scholarship, one cannot forget the great contribution of in-house Baha'i scholars such as Mirza Abul Fazl, Fazil Mazandarani and Ishraq Khabari in the East, in, the, in various fields of Baha'i scholarship. Abul Fazl was a great scholar. He devoted his entire scholarly efforts to the awakening of his countrymen, defending the Baha'i principles and establishing the righteousness of the Baha'i faith in accordance with the previous sacred books. He devoted his entire time and energy to educating, uplifting, encouraging the Baha'is and developing their communities. He was responsible to show the non-Baha'i religious scholars of his time the meaning of a new day, new dispensation, and the necessity for new approaches towards the meaningful practice of religion. He was a champion of defending the covenant and defeating the claims of the covenant breakers. He left behind dozens of books and treatises in about 40 years of his solid scholarship on historical, doctrinal, and prophetic proofs of the Baha'i and the Babi movements. Fazel Mazandarani, who passed away in 1957, came into the faith from a learned family. He devoted his entire life, either in the West, or when he was in the East, he traveled to the West, he collected historical documents and to study, understand, and describe the nature of the Baha'i and the Babi histories. After historians and chroniclers such as Nabil Zarandi, 
he produces his zuhur al-haq, the advent of the truth, the most extensive historical study of the Baha'i and the Babi faith in nine volumes of several thousand pages. He categorized the writings of the central figures of the faith under hundreds of titles in four volumes of his Amr Bakhal, the realms of command and the realms of creation. He wrote the history of religions from the Baha'i perspective, and he left behind his magnificent encyclopedic work with hundreds of entries in five volumes of more than 1,600 pages. He served the Baha'i administration and was commissioned by Abdul Baha and Shoghi Afandi to carry on several important missions around the world. From 1926 to 1972, Ishra Khawari passed away in 1972 and reached the quality and the quantity of Baha'i scholarship by writing historical works, apologetic treatises, by working on the Baha'i jurisprudence, by writing commentaries on the leading works of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and the Guardian, and by classification and publication of the writings of the faith in more than a dozen volumes which contain hundreds of tablets of Allah Abdul Baha and the letters of Shoghi Afandi. He traveled extensively, promoted the faith energetically, and uplifted the spirit of the Baha'i communities wherever he went. He was a devoted, selfless, and energetic teacher and a scholar for about half a century in various fields of Baha'i scholarship in the Persian language. There is no time to even touch upon the contributions of Sadr al-Sudur, Muhammad Ali Faizi, Azizullah Soleimani, Mr. Baliuzi, and so on, and many, many other scholars in, who has enriched the historical study of the Baha'i faith in the last century. The contribution and the enrichment of the scholarly heritage of these scholars is another important responsibility of the present and the future generation of the Baha'i scholars. Development of the Baha'i scholarship in the East, which lasted for decades until the early 1970s when Shah Hawari passed away, faced the waves of opposition and persecution of the Baha'i communities in Iran from 1970s onwards. And since then, for more than three decades, it has considerably showed, a slowed, I mean, I'm sorry, a slowed down in Iran. But the Baha'i scholarship in the West has been active during the last several decades, thanks to the Western veteran and new generation of Baha'i scholars, the name of some of whom were just mentioned before my talk, particularly in the areas of historical research and academic papers that have been published on a variety of issues and critical commentaries that they have produced on many sacred texts of the faith is beyond the scope of my presentation. In discussing the evolution role, evolutionary role, role of the Baha'i scholarship, one cannot avoid a brief look at the future role and responsibilities of the Baha'i scholarship as has been envisioned in the writings of the central figures of the faith and the messages of the Universal House of Justice. One of the characteristics of today's human race is as referred to by the Universal House of Justice in the Rezvan message of 1988 is the hunger for meaning and yearning of the soul. A spiritual hunger is characterized by restlessness and dissatisfaction with the moral state of society. It's also evident in the upsurge of fundamentalism among various religious sects. Hunger is also responsible for the creation of new movements posing as religions or aspiring to take the place of religion. 
you know what I mean on this point. In the face of the hunger or meaning, in the face of the hunger for meaning and yearning of the soul, what would be expected from the Baha'i scholarship? In answering such a, such a question, one might refer to the letter of the October 21st of 1943 of the Beloved Guardian, which says the cause needs, this has been repeatedly quoted in this conference, the cause needs more Baha'i scholars, people who not only are devoted to it, to, to it and believe in it, and are anxious to tell others about it, but also who have a deep grasp of the teachings and their significance, and who can correlate its belief with the current thoughts and problems of the people of the world. He further says, in a letter written on his behalf on the 5th of July of 1949, saying that if the Baha'is want to be really effective in teaching the cause, they need to be much better informed and able to discuss intelligently, intellectually, the present condition of the world and its problems. We need Baha'i scholars, not only people far, far more deeply aware of what our teachings really are, but also well-read, well-educated people, capable of correlating our teachings to the current thoughts of the leaders of society. We Baha'is should, in other words, arm our minds with knowledge in order to better demonstrate to, especially, the educated classes, the truth enshrined in our faith. The end of the quote from the Guardian. In order to materialize the recommendation and the wishes of the beloved Guardian, the House of Justice wrote in the Resvan message of 1984 that there can be no doubt that the progress of the cause from this time onward will be categorized by an ever-increasing relationship to the agencies, activities, institutions, and leading individuals of the non-Baha'i world. We shall acquire greater status, stature, at the United Nations, become better known in the deliberation of governments, a familiar figure to the media a subject of interest to the academics and inevitably the envy of failing establishment. Our preparation for and response to this situation must be continual deepening of our faith and unwavering adherence to its principles of abstention abstention from partisan politics and freedom from prejudice and above all in an increasing understanding of its fundamental varieties and relevance to the modern world. Okay. The themes of this message have received much more elaboration and explanation and, and explanation in the following message of the House of Justice since the 1980s and up to the present time. Many of these messages, particularly since the mid-90s, call for fostering a culture of learning, consultation and action aiming at construction of a global civilization. To achieve these goals, openness of the Baha'i communities to the wider society and utilizing the expressive the experiences and the spiritual, secular knowledge of the learned Baha'is are needed to contribute to the process of the integration of the human society in its struggle towards reaching 
its destined goal, which is the new world order that the faith must establish. The integration is one of the twofold processes of integration and disintegration that Shoghi Afani describes their forces in his world order of Baha'u'llah. While the Baha'i individuals, communities, and institutions have a constructive role to play in the process of the integration, the destructive forces that characterize the disintegration should be identified with a civilization that has refused to answer to the expectations of a new age and is consequently falling into chaos and decline. This is the end from the World Order of Baha'u'llah, page 17, the exact word of the Guardian. It's important to know to now look closer into the requirements and prerequisites for Baha'is who would like to contribute to the scholarly works of the faith. It's clear that the deep knowledge of the Baha'i writings, works of Shoghi Afandi, messages of the House of Justice, are the foundation of Baha'i scholarship. In addition, it is also necessary, I'm calling the younger, generation of Baha'i scholars here and those who are going to rise. It is also necessary for the serious students of the Baha'i scholarship to have thorough knowledge and sound understanding of the history of the Babi and the Baha'i faith. Its challenges, developments, and the spirit and the energies that were generated in those movements. Full familiarity with the historical sources, nature and chronology of the events, achievements, changes, expansion, persecution, and the development of the Baha'i women particularly, and the Baha'i institutions are but a few leading areas of research for the Baha'i scholars who are interested in its history. In order to efficiently to effectively working on the Baha'i scholarship, it is essential to consider the thoughts of Shoghi Afandi on this issue. When he was asked about his advice and recommendations, he would reply to a study history, economics, and sociology in order to be familiar with the progressive movements and thoughts being put forth today so that the Baha'is could correlate these to the Baha'i teachings. In addition to those specific fields that Shoghi Efendi refers to, it adds an extra dimension to one's scholarship if he or she acquires special skills and expertise in the languages of the revelation, i.e. Arabic and Persian, and sound knowledge of the history of religions, particularly Islam and the Quranic sciences in which the Baha'i faith is rooted. Knowing the methodology of research and critical scholarly work is also essential. It is worth looking for a moment into those factors that can foster and develop the Baha'i scholarship. The Universal House of Justice says believers, the, the, the Universal House of Justice believes that both International Teaching Center and the Board of Counselors can render valuable services in the field of Baha'i scholarship by encouraging budding scholars and also by promoting within the Baha'i community an atmosphere of tolerance for the views of others. In addition to those institutions, it is vital as a personal initiative to establish research centers, research funds, and research scholarship for Baha'is and non-Baha'is who are interested in Baha'i scholarship. 
to facilitate and finance the research projects more than the support, encouragement, and financial assistance of the Baha'i institutions and contributions of the individuals, there are a few other elements that have to be taken into consideration. One, it is the role of the Baha'i scholarship to show what is necessary to further develop and expand the growth of the faith. Two, how to nourish the Baha'i scholarship and how to bring forth the new generation of Baha'i scholars. Three, how in the light of new technology and web sciences, new tools and skills can become available to the Baha'i scholars. Number four, how intellectual creativity and innovative critical thinking of the Baha'i intellectuals can be encouraged, supported, and receive necessary attention. And finally, what would be the role and the contribution of the collective attitude of the Baha'is towards the creation of an environment which will be conducive to a, large, to a larger and deeper areas of scholarship and scholarly activities? And finally, how a scholarly efforts of the Baha'i scholars can be more harmonized to aim at the attraction of more people to the faith and particularly to aim at the areas which impact the non-Baha'i intellectuals. I leave you with those hard and challenging questions and would like to end this humble presentation by thanking again the ABS organizers who gave me this opportunity to address the issue of the evolution of the Baha'i scholarship and to quote from the guardian, the beloved guardian, the following excerpt from his letter that was written on his behalf in August 1943, where he has stated, we need profound Baha'i scholars in the future, both to teach and to administer the cause and to answer questions of the public and help rebuild the world. This is a great challenge to you all and presents a wonderful opportunity for service to humanity, the end of the quotation of the Guardian. My final point that I would like to present to you, you as the rebuilders of the world, and the major contributors to its spiritual awakening comes from the charter of the future world civilization where Baha'u'llah says, Happy are ye, O ye the learned ones. Happy are ye, O ye the learned ones in Baha. By the Lord, ye are the blows of the most mighty ocean, the stars of the firmament of glory, the standards of triumph waving bewitched earth and heaven. Ye are the manifestations of a steadfastness amidst men and the day spring of divine utterance to all that dwell on earth. Well is it with him that turneth unto you and woe betide the forward. This day it behooveth whoso had quaffed the mystic wine of everlasting life from the hands of the loving kindness of the Lord, his God, the merciful, to pulsate even as the throbbing artery in the body of mankind that brought him, that threw him 
may be quickened the world and every crumbling bomb. Thank you so much for your attention.